from thatching to stonemasonry or metalwork, Britain's master craftsmen were central to every aspect of life. Down the centuries, their workmanship has defined the fabric of this country, from the grandest cathedral to the simplest of tools. So as part of your detective work, you're saying that the actual details of construction, not just telling you how it's made, but why it's made and who it's made for. That's right, yeah. There are still guardians of these crafts working today who are dedicated to taking the long tradition of these skills into our modern world. I'm going to rotate it round, keeping the bevel on the work. In this series, complete beginners with a genuine passion to learn will be given an intensive introduction by some of these experts. Some things are really, really important, some things aren't. And I'll point out when things are important. Yeah. This is one of the important well, ones. ones. Yeah. But can a complete novice master even the basic elements of the craft in a short space of time, however intensive? It's not a mistake I haven't made, I shouldn't think. If I haven't made it, I've seen somebody else make it. And will they have acquired the skills to make something that is both beautiful and useful? Making this chair yeah. has been one of the most amazing things that I've ever done. Until the First World War, every house would have had bowls and spoons and very often simple chairs and tables, all made from the woods. Now, this was green wood, wood that was coppice, cut down, what you and I would really think of as firewood, and then made by skilled craftsmen, often in the woods themselves, and sold right across the country. Every community would have had its green wood craftsmen. Now, that trade is almost gone. The skill is almost lost, but it does linger on in pockets of woodland around the country. For a thousand years, there was hardly a corner of daily life that didn't depend upon the craftsmanship of the green woodworker, from building houses or the great naval warships to making furniture and tool handles. Until the end of the 19th century, thousands of craftsmen worked in the woods, and bodgers' camps were a familiar sight. A bodger was the name given to chair makers, making every part of the chair, from felling the tree to assembly, in outdoor, largely homemade workshops. Today, there are just 600 full-time green woodworkers in the country who continue this tradition. Working in woodlands, I mean, in particular, carving green wood is something I've done a little bit of and I'd love to do much more. And in fact, if there was one craft that I wanted to master, this would be it. I've come to meet Guy Mallinson, who traded his successful cabinet-making business in London, where he used mill timber and the latest gadgets and machines, for a life in Dorset dedicated to the simplicity of green woodcraft. This is fantastic. Hello. Hello. Welcome. I'm Monty. Guy. Good to meet you. This is wonderful. Oh, it's a lovely place to work. We're very, very lucky. Working with Greenwood is a world away from modern carpentry, with its dependency on seasoned timber and power tools. So what made you go from all your years of cabinet making to Greenwood, which many might see as a, as a retrogressive process? You're just so much more in touch with the material this way. And you know, if you think all those years in London, never really saw a tree or understood where the material came from, that sort of feedback you get from these very direct processes is, is enormously fulfilling. Green wood is unseasoned wood. Yes, it's freshly cut or up to 18 months old. We use it fresh for a number of reasons. One of the main ones being that it's very soft, very soft to work. So you, it's like cutting butter. You dry some components, you leave some wet put them together and as it shrinks it locks the whole structure so we don't use any glue or any screws or anything like that. What qualities make someone who will become a good green worker? I think it's an affinity with the material mm. uh, and the ability to focus on a repetitive task are probably the most important things. Our three aspiring greenwood workers are all drawn to the craft for different reasons. For Charles Hooper from West Sussex, a former advertising executive turned garden designer, it's a chance for him to re-establish a connection with wood that inspired him as a boy. This is my shed. This is where I'm going to make all my bits and bobs. Here's an old trunk basket that I made when I was a tiny little boy, and my father kept it, bless his cotton socks. It's still got my name written inside on pencil. He was obviously very proud of me. This was a table lamp that I made when I was at school for my father, but when he died, he had it beside his bed, and I found it, and I was about to throw it away, and I went, oh, I made that. And it's lasted all these years. I like making stuff. <laughs> Hi, you've done 
to pizza. Sarah Charlton, a single mother from Lincoln, has reinvented herself after a divorce and discovered in the process an unexpected passion for woodwork. She's currently a full-time craft student but wants to use woodcraft skills to support her young family. I went back to uni because I wanted to be, I want to be a craft person. I want to design and, and make objects made out of wood. And that's been a long journey, and I'm it's a journey that I'm still on. And for Tom Vaughan, a woodwork supply teacher who lives with his girlfriend in Plymouth, this is an opportunity to follow his gut instinct and dramatically change his working life. I should have gone down the route of doing something like furniture design, furniture making. It will give me an opportunity to make a career making things in a really sustainable way, and I think that's incredibly exciting. That's where I want to do for the rest of my life, really. For these three trainees, yeah. what are you expecting of them? It's going to be difficult for them. To make something is relatively easy, but to become good at it takes an awful long time. I'm Monty. Hi, Monty. I'm Tom. Tom. Tom, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Pleasure. Hi, I'm Sarah. Sarah, nice to meet you. Hi there. Charles. Charles. Hi. And this is where you're going to be working. You need to come around through oh, here. It's tasty and warm. It's warm, it's dry, oh, it's beautiful. You're doing pretty well already, aren't you? Yeah. 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 This is Guy. Hello. Sarah. So nice to meet you. Hi, Guy. Hi, Guy. Good to meet you. Charles. Hello. Hi, Charles. Welcome to your new home in the woods. Thank you. Guy uses his open-air workshop for teaching short courses, but this will be home to the trainees for the next six weeks. During that time, they'll be taught the basics of green woodcraft before taking on the final challenge of both designing and making their own chair which is reckoned to be the definitive showcase for Greenwood skills. If any of them make the grade, and that isn't a foregone conclusion, the most accomplished chair will go on prominent display at the nearby 12th century former monastery, Ford Abbey, to be seen by tens of thousands of visitors. For today, we're going to be doing a very basic exercise in um, making a spatula. It may not sound terribly exciting, but it covers a lot of the techniques that we'll be using in more complex pieces later. The very first step in all of this is selecting your timber. Um, we've got some sycamore here, some cherry, and some ash and sweet chestnut. Do these all have traditional uses? They do, and, and sycamore particularly for kitchenware. Um, it has this sort of antibacterial quality to it. So let's start with some cleaving anyway. Start with one big hit in the middle. And there you go. All green woodwork begins with cleaving, rather than sawing, the timber down to size, as splitting the wood with the grain conserves its natural strength. Ooh. Very satisfying. Have you done this before? No, I haven't. <laughs> I think that's pretty obvious. No, yeah, careful, careful. But do you think strength is going to be an issue? I think it is. I'm going to try and keep up with the, with the boys. Oh. I think that could be a prehistoric... Uh, Spatula on its own. Does that seem all right? Well done, yeah, great. We're now going on to the shaving horse, the old version of the uh, Black & Decker Workmate. It's designed for gripping our piece of wood. And what we're going to do is try and make this into a plank shape so that we can draw on it for our spatula. And in order to do that, we're going to use a tool called a draw knife, which is one of the most beautifully simple bits of equipment you'll ever use. One, two, three. And with some deft pulls of the draw knife and a little whittling, Guy makes a perfect spatula in under 10 minutes. I could spend ages smoothing that off, but that's what you need to make. Fabulous. Very good. And now it's their turn. You give it a bit of oomph. Look, that should come out then. That's it. That's a good shearing action, though. That's great. I chose the spatula project intentionally because it, it's very apparent, very, very quickly, who has natural aptitude for this craft. If you've got it, it's very apparent, and if you haven't got it, it's equally as apparent. Are you finding that easy? I've kind of drawn out my, um, my pattern now. I wanted to do, like, a curvaceous pattern design. Curves are hard. Yeah, they are, aren't they? Yeah. Well, you've nearly finished. I started off making a spatula, and I've now made a knife. I mean, obviously, you, you feel quite comfortable doing it. It's lovely. I think it's the kind of thing that all boys do in the woods, isn't it? I agree. It's extraordinary how 
an everyday implement like a spatula, we now take completely for granted. We have no knowledge and more damningly, no interest in how it was made, where it was made and who made it. But there's a kind of liberation in being able to make your own tools that has a very profound effect. And this is, this is a real kind of freedom. It's very early days, of course, but already the difference in the trainees' skill levels is plainly visible. Everyone yeah. started with a pretty much an essential, yeah. essentially similar piece of wood. Yeah. And ended up with three very, very different objects. And how did you feel about it? I was stopped that. because the point where I would have yeah, yeah. ended up with nothing. Um, but yes, yeah, <laughs> I really enjoyed myself. What about you? I was pleased with this bit here. But in, ambitious to attempt curves like this, really, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Very ambitious. I think when I know um, I'm doing two things at the same time, I think, I'm kind of um, learning the skill and trying to get my design in at the same time. And, and Charles is yours. is a nice feel to it, isn't it? It's got a way to go, but I think, you know, as, um, as Tom said, it's trying to know when to stop. My first impressions with Tom, um, he's very methodical in his work, which is a really good quality for this sort of work. Um, and I, I felt that the spatula that he made was exactly how he wanted it to end up. Charles, uh, I think he's got it within him, but quite a, quite a way to go yet. Sarah certainly struggled with most aspects of it, both the technical, how the tool works, how the wood works. This is the spatula that we were making. This is what Sarah's made. They're quite obviously two very different things. She's pleased with the design, <laughs> that the fact that it's sort of, it's the decorating seems to be the thing for her. And I've got to refocus that onto the craft. <laughs> Although this is just the most lovely environment, I think that what our trainees are going to find is that sensation wears off quite fast. And that they're going to have to draw on reserves of patience, just doing the same thing over and over again. And that's going to test them. We all have different you know, creative uh, abilities, and I think that we're learning a skill, but it's going to be really how we take that further. I'm just going to have to, you know, give it all what I've got, really. But it's it's complete it's it's completely different to, to anything that I've ever done. To provide some inspiration, Guy is taking the trainees to meet David Saltmarsh, an award-winning greenwood worker whose chairs fetch up to seven hundred pounds a piece. This is the sort of thing that, after many years, one would aspire to be able to do. Six weeks. But not a hope in hell. <laughs> Greenwood chairs have huge advantages over those made from seasoned wood. They're stronger, lighter, and more flexible. But making them requires real skill. Roughly, how many hours do you think you might have put into that? 50. 50? Yeah, and the one behind it, probably about 60 or 70. So it's a lot of work, isn't it? Yeah. How much do you sell them for? Am I allowed to ask that? I like to get at least £10 an hour. Is that all? Yeah. Do people appreciate what's gone into it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you yeah, find they do, that? Yeah. They're incredibly well made. Greenwood craft is never going to earn you a fortune, and commissions can be few and far between, which means that almost all those who choose it as a career have to find other ways to supplement their income. I should explain that David does this part time, he runs a farm yeah. as well. But you know, the quality of these is second to none. He's got a lot of giving. It's very inspiring to hear that he actually just did less than a week, I think, actually having tuition and then has really taught himself all these skills afterwards, which is, which is great to hear because that's something I'm going to have to do, I think, if I want to take this on. This is a pole lathe. And it's beautifully simple and effective lathe that woodmen have used for centuries. And by mastering this, it then means you can make things like chair legs or any kind of rounded object. And the trainees will have to get really quite good on this. So, Sarah, Charles and Tom must now begin the process of mastering the lathe, as the next step in their Greenwood education is to learn how to turn wood. To give them all something to practice on, Guy has produced rather an unusual tool. All right, morning everyone. Today, we're going to make one of these which is a priest for bopping fish on the head with. All I'm looking for from you guys this morning is to be able to make a billet that is perfectly circular in section, absolutely dead straight. 
the advantage of this is it covers lots and lots of processes um, in a very short period of time, and I really want to push them on there. So that's not a million miles mm. off. I spent, what, five minutes doing that? I wouldn't expect you to spend much longer than that getting to there. But shaping the billet, that's the cleft initial piece of wood, into a cylinder is the easy bit. It spins one way, then the other. You can see, going backwards, forwards, backwards, forwards, which is where it differs from the mechanical lathe that some of you have used in the past. I'm going to start off with the roughing out gouge. Your cut is when you're pushing down on the downstroke, coming towards you, cut, 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 cut. Right. Take the tool away, let it return. Oh. The angle is terribly important. And what we're trying to do is cut, not scrape. If you cut, you get nice long shavings. Next tool is the square chisel. And angle it over at 30 degrees-ish. Teasing those along, you really, really need to concentrate on this. That's all you have to do. All we have to do. Now, I presume you can remember all that lot. Mm. Oh, absolutely. Excellent. Well, let's just do it then. It's a lot to take in, but the competitive edge seems to help. It's one of those sort of memory games, I think, more than anything else. As you can see, I'm leaping into it today because I don't want to fall behind old Speedy Gonzalez over there. It's a bit like riding a skateboard. When you get it, you get it, and then you lose it again. About eight different things going on at once. Once they relax into the rhythm of it and get lost in it, that's the point at which you can see the people who really get on well with the lathe. It's just so easy to catch the chisel. Every time you catch it, you've got to take all that work away, and then it gets smaller and smaller. You get into a rhythm of like what you're doing, and then everything changes. It's like, like being left-handed and going right-handed, I think. None of them are finding it easy, but some are struggling more than others. That, 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 whoa, whoa, whoa. You were pulling away, you want to push right. against. That's it. I can't go any narrower here. I mean, that's it. Otherwise, the first time you hit it on anything, it's going... I try and be a little bit more methodical about it. That is one of my around. things that I don't do, and I seem to go you're, all over the place. You're jumping around yeah, the place, I um, do. and that makes it more difficult for you. Yeah. I realise that he's made a cosh for minnows. It'd still work, though, wouldn't it? <laughs> on very small fish. There you go. What do you think of that? So, well, I think it's really good. Oh, thank you. I think you've done really well. You've mastered the technique of that square chisel, mm. which was the most difficult thing. Um, it's now just practice. Come on. Mark one or mark two? I will do them together. You were obviously getting frustrated with mark one. I admire the way you went for it. You mm. really got stuck in, which was the point of the exercise. Mm. Yeah, it's a bit rough here, it's a bit rough there, but you were learning. That, yeah, mm. that's, that's the point. Sarah, here's yours. Is it good? It's not brilliant, but you have managed to make something following very complicated instructions. You didn't get all of them, but a stride forward. I'm not sure you thought too much about how it's been used. I think you may have thought an awful lot about how it looks. Keep practicing. Thank you. Getting to grips with the tools of this craft will inevitably take some time, even for the woodwork teacher, Tom. Didn't really get on with the pole, though. Everybody found it quite amusing that I'd made a matchstick. I'm sure if I could go make another one quite quickly and a lot better. Can I hold the real rod thing? Yeah, you need to put a worm on first. Bloody yeah. hell. <laughs> <laughs> I certainly will have to spend more time with Sarah than the others. I'm going to have to find a way of setting her challenges that are achievable and beneficial to her. When you get to about one o'clock, there it go. Being the rubbish one at it, yeah, it, is, it isn't very nice. I quite like the pole lathe. I like its simplicity. I like it being, you know, an ancient piece of machinery, I suppose. Oh, well shot. Awesome. Very good priest, Charlie. <laughs> Tom and I walked down this morning and we were both full of awe about this place. I mean, what a wonderful place to work. That was fun, Guy. And it's so nice of you to cook a lovely dinner for us this afterwards. Yeah. Not... Well, to so be I fair, Tom it. did the cooking. Slaughter a few fish. Yeah, but what about the one that got Can away? Just... Oh, what about that one? That was huge.
These skills and techniques used by green woodcraft have had a major impact in shaping the way that our towns and villages look. And nowhere is this more evident than in my own county of Herefordshire. Working with greenwood doesn't just apply itself to items like chairs and bowls and spatulas. Exactly the same set of skills can be applied to much larger projects. So using just the same techniques as making a chair, you can put it together and construct a building as big as a vast cathedral. Although it appears to be made entirely from stone, Hereford Cathedral is actually a good example of medieval woodwork. It would have been impossible to construct these soaring structures and their roofs without locking them together with giant and enormously strong greenwood timbers. These are original timbers, six, seven hundred years old. Oak, that is as strong as any iron that you can imagine. And here, this joint, exactly the same kind of thing that makes a chair. The joints done when the oak is green, and then as they season, they tighten and they move and they lock. The whole of this cathedral is essentially a wooden building clad in stone. And just across the cathedral close, there's some fascinating greenwood restoration work taking place. Hi, Monty. You all right? I'm very well. Good, thanks. Up until the middle of the 16th century, one-tenth of all agricultural harvest and produce had to be given directly to the church. This was known as the tithe, and the resulting crops were stored in buildings known as tithe barns. The repair work on this barn has revealed the same greenwood techniques that were used to build the cathedral. I can see they're putting this beam in now. Yeah. That's an oak beam. That's an oak beam. That's green. That's green oak, yeah. Right. That's green oak. This barn originally dates back to the 13th century, but has been continually altered and rebuilt over the centuries. And did the methods of construction evolve during that period as well, or is it fundamentally the same? Because it's a timber frame, yeah. we still use the same sort of methods today. So what you're doing now is pretty much what they would have done in 12, yeah. whatever it was, 12 years. Exactly, exactly, yeah. The original timbers display signs of very sophisticated joinery, which offers some fascinating insights into its history. What we've yeah. got here is an evidence that it's more than just your average barn. The type of joint that they've used here is a tabled scarf, but what makes it different is that on the squinted shoulders, you've got a V'd cut here. Now, I like your language. Scarf joint, squinted shoulders. Yeah. Just tell me what a squinted shoulder is. A squinted shoulder is that. There, so it's that the angle. angle. It's the angle, which right. basically stops that from dropping down. Are you saying that's too fancy for an average barn? Yeah. Normally, you'd just have a square shoulder there, and you so, still have the squinting, but it wouldn't be V'd. So as part of your detective work, you're saying that the actual details of construction, the, the really particular details, not just telling you how it's made, but why it's made and who it's made for. That's right, yeah. More than likely it was um, part of the canon's residence or storage for the canon. How long would you expect timber like this or a building like this to last if it's looked after properly? I would have thought it's been here for sort of 700 years. I would have thought you'd, you're looking at another three to 400. A thousand years. It's now halfway through our trainees course. And soon, they'll have to both design and make their own chairs, unassisted, which will then be judged by the UK's leading greenwood expert. It's now going to get a whole lot more difficult. The difference being we're going to have to work very accurately there. First, they must learn how to make the basic components of a chair by copying this relatively simple example. With this chair, if you get the tolerances more than 0.2 of a mil out, it will not work. If you make components that are not to the right tolerance, they're going in the fire. Um, if you make a chair and sell it, and it falls apart and someone falls over and breaks their back, you're going to get it in the neck. How much wood did that chair take to make then? One of these. Just one, one of them? Yep. That's amazing, isn't it? Using a log of freshly felled ash, making this chair will introduce them to a number of new skills unique to green woodcraft. The first pieces we're going to make, the first components, are the rungs, which are these cylindrical pieces here. And then I'll take you through the stages to get them very accurately made with very accurate tenons on either end. The tenon is the bit that goes into the hole, which is the mortise. This exercise calls for absolute accuracy and concentration. Now, we need to get that down to 17.5 mil, 
to within a tolerance of 0.2 of a mil. No pressure then. Okay, but I've got a special tool for that. And you now have a tenon that's an inch long and exactly 17 and a half mil. The great thing about making so many, I think we're going to make nine in total, is that you actually get to practice something. To make this mix of components for the first time, all of which have to fit so precisely together, would be daunting for anyone. But Sarah feels it might just be beyond her. Now we're at this point, I'm, I haven't got the skills to do this and it's worrying me a bit. And you're absolutely right, because I have been worried about it as well, having seen what I've seen. But it's, it's not going to be your strong point. I think you've got to give it a go. Yeah, well, I think get, get, get stuck in. And then at the end of today, if we've got a pile of sticks that have all gone on the fire, then we'll have to reevaluate and work out what to do about it. If I can do these next steps, it'd be amazing. Ooh, is that down? This is scary. However, Charles and Tom both seem to be rising to the challenge. This is my second, and this one's going loads better. It's taken about half a time so far. I would like to measure that. 17.5. Bang on perfect. Yeah, you're right. I think I've gone too far, but... It needs to be 17.5 mil. Give, give or take 0.2 of a mil. It's 16.2 mil. Oh. It's a long way out. Long way out. Got to do a bit of work on measuring. Yes. Uh, it, some things are really, really important. Some things aren't. And I'll point out when things are important. Yeah. This is one of the important, important ones. ones. Yep. Keeping you warm, guys. Look. Stunning. Seeing that Sarah is really struggling, Guy takes her to one side and proposes a less ambitious alternative. I'm afraid, sir, I didn't think we were going to be able to make a chair in the time that we've got. No. I think that if you were to make a stool, that would involve all the skills we're trying to learn and enable you to finish with a feeling of pride and having achieved something. How would you feel about aiming for a stool. I'd love to make a stool again. Yeah. Brilliant. The following morning, Tom and Charles crack on with making their chair components, while Sarah sets to work on a stool. So we're looking for 17 and a half, 18.2. Oh, well, it's too big, so that's all right. Well, it's not great, but it's not, like, perfect. It's not great, so all of those need re redoing, but okay. at least it's not a disaster. Over the next few days, the ability to keep their concentration becomes increasingly demanding. It's at points like this that you start thinking, milled timber sounds quite good. And Sarah's not the only one finding it tough to sustain the level of accuracy needed. I'm a millimetre too narrow for, for it to be OK. Sorry, mate. Two and a half hours I've been doing that. If you're trying to make these for some sort of living, no one's going to pay you to make a mistake like that. After a week of toiling over legs, slats, rungs and rails, precise to point two of a mill, it's time for the fun bit. Steam bending is the part of green woodworking in which the wood is softened up and bent. When I got it open, bung them in, and I'll close the door again. The wood is steamed for an hour for every inch of thickness. It's very important to work quickly as it comes out of the steamer, yeah. so it'll be stiffening up for every second okay. it comes across this. One, two, three, watch the steam. It's an exciting moment because you're actually getting the, the leg that you've carved and you're, you're now forming it into the shape that it's going to be in the chair. There's not a moment to spare if the wood is to be bent to shape. OK, and start bending down. I can't get that bottom one on. It's cooling down every second there. Got to get that right down there. That's it. Wow. <laughs> no hanging about. No. And that is still hot. OK, we're home. Cool. And relax. And breathe. <laughs> it's a seriously cool process. As well as using and controlling the incredible pliability of wood whilst it's still green, Greenwood Craftsman can also harness its natural shrinking properties. So now we're going to dry the rungs. Um, the point being that when they're dry, they're going to shrink twice as much that way, along the length of the grain as that way, and become an oval section. 
which is absolutely critical to the next day. And then we'll leave that there overnight tonight and see what they're like in the morning. It's shrunk twice as much that way as that way. Brilliant. So we're now going to put the squeeze of these into the wet holes here. That grain direction there yep. has to go across the joint that way. Okay. Not like that. No. Like that. And it'll make a slightly alarming creaking noise. As they dry, the holes will shrink, locking tight around the oval rungs and fixing the joint firmly together. Just try and pull that out. There's no glue, no it's nothing. Amazing. You will not be able to get that out. And as that shrinks, it gets tighter as well. Put it over there. Guy's method for testing the strength of the chair frame joints is not for the faint-hearted. Wow. Yay. Is that strong enough? Yeah. Right, let's put the rest of it together. Go on. The end's in sight now, and there's just one more job to do, which is to drill the remaining mortises. This is kind of critical we get this part right, because it kind of ruins everything if we don't. I think we're quite anxious, mostly because Guy looks really nervous. <laughs> that's, what's, that's what's kind of set us off a bit. That is way out, so don't ask me what's happened. Oh, that's a shame. I'm going to burst into tears. <laughs> it's one of those things about the craft, having to focus every single moment, and that this is one of those big moments they've got to get right. Despite their various setbacks, after eight days of painstaking work, all of the pieces finally come together. You've made a stool. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> we made a stool. No, no, you made a stool. <laughs> I just showed you, you how. <laughs> Thank you. There we go. Yeah. Well done, Tom. Well done, Tom. There's not one fixing in there that I'm used to using, like glue or screws or anything. It's just all on understanding the characteristics of the material, and it's a pretty satisfying experience, I must say. Whilst the trainees continue to hone their new skills in Dorset, I'm off to Wales and the Pembrokeshire coast to look at a completely different use for Greenwood. When you're in the middle of a wood, you can get the sense of being deeply landlocked, but of course this is a tiny island, and from very earliest times, the easiest way to move around it was by boat. And right up until the 19th century, all our boats, from the great naval fleets that defeated the Armada and Nelson's fleet, to the humblest craft, were made always of green wood. I've come here to meet Terry Kenny, who practices the ancient craft of coracle making. Nice to meet you. Hello there. Hi. What's this? Uh, this is the framework of an iron bridge coracle. And the framework is completed. I'm just sawing off the surplus and then it will be covered with calico and painted it, with bitumastic paint. It's extraordinarily simple, isn't it? I it mean, is. It's a basic boat, yeah. Were they always made from greenwood? Yes, always made from greenwood. Uh, usually willow, but in later times it became uh, ash. So, when it's green like this, I mean, these are very, very flimsy strips, but very bendable, I guess. Yes, that's right. You, you need the flexibility, obviously, to, to get the curves and to, to put the framework together. Yeah. But the fact that they're interwoven, that they lock together... Yeah, I mean, this, this is strength. rigid. That's, that's yes. strong. Yes. I mean, what did they use them for? All sorts of things. The, the Welsh coracles became kind of specialised as inland fishing boats. Yeah. The Ironbridge type were much more of a general purpose boat. Uh, used a lot for just crossing the river mm. to avoid paying the toll on the Iron Bridge and for setting night lines for eels and so forth. So this was a poor man's craft? Oh, very much so. The old fellow down at Iron Bridge used to say, if you saw a man carrying a coracle, it's not worth mugging him. He's got no pennies on him. Right, so he's got no, a poor man's boat. I wasn't going to come all this way without having a go. And the beauty of these boats is you can just pick them up and sling them over your shoulder. These are amazingly light. When you think that it's a boat, I could go off poaching, avoiding my tolls, fishing. Yes. Walking with them is the easy bit, but getting into them without any in the water is much harder. For your first attempt, it's a good idea for somebody to hold it while you get in. Okay. Get your weight into the middle as soon as you can. OK, I'm in the middle. OK, okay. okay. you feel comfortable? Yeah. That's it. You have a very, very basic craft made out of probably the most ancient of all skills, which is green woodwork. Yes. 
but it does the job. It's but exactly, not a lot yes, more. Yes. Well, if you define a boat as something that keeps you afloat, it does the job, yeah. doesn't it? And, and gets you from A to B. Yeah. Albeit in a very circular a way. Gentle way, yes. What I really like about this is the illustration that Greenwood crafts weren't just the province of the lone woodman working for years to master this arcane series of skills, but very practical, applying to a huge range and diversity of people for an equally vast range of applications. And in the end, it was about tools, making something that did the job, making it from available materials and making it cheap. Back in Dorset, the group are now nearly four weeks into their training. And they're about to have a taste of commercial Greenwood reality. Skittles is very popular in many West Country pubs, and Guy has been given a commission to make a new set of Skittles by his local. So he's decided to use the job as an exercise to see how the trainees cope with the pressure of working with clients to a strict specification and deadline. Balls can travel at anything up to 45 miles an hour and they shatter and break. Dimensions need to be very similar and they must be capable of standing up vertically from either end. Quite heavy work turning something like this, isn't it? I think it's to... going to be hard work, but I think we can do it. On this task, they'll be working as a team with Guy to produce okay, nine no, skittles. Like and he's giving them a deadline of just two days to complete the whole set. But even the initial cleaving is presenting some problems. It is too heavy. You're so, sorry, you've gone back. Right, look, look what you're doing. Right, I'll show you what you're doing and then you might see. You're doing this. I can't, no, it's right, too heavy. This. I can't listen, do anything listen, else because this. Charles just told me to right, do something. Hold it like that. Hold it tight and you're, I, right, you're not doing it in your wrist. It, what, you're doing it's, I, 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 I can physically move. can't do it like that. This will be the largest block of wood they'll ever have to work with and it will be really hard work. I think they're going to be very, very tired of it today. They've got a lot to do. A lot of it's very physical. One telegraph pole. I kind of get the feeling that they've got quite high standards. I don't think they're going to beat around the bush if they're not up to scratch. And they all have to match. And odds on, if one doesn't match, it's going to be mine, isn't it? It's, it's just a job just to, to get it on the lathe and even start turning a cylinder, let alone shaping it into a skittle shape. I'm beginning to uh, recognise the advantages of the advent of the Industrial Revolution, quite <laughs> honestly. Bring on power. All you have to do is make it like that. Great. We've roughed out nine. Guy's finished one. And Tom has... Tom's further ahead than I am. It's been a long day and I'm tired and I want to go home and I want to have a bath. Sarah is finding the sheer physical demands of the job completely overwhelming. It's really tough. I came in this morning and I was being really positive. Yeah, it's a team project and, you know, build up the team and I can't do it. Guy calls it a day and sends them all home to rest and recharge. Morning. Hi, guys. We really do need to finish these today. Just one skittle was completed yesterday, and they'll need to speed up dramatically if they're to have any chance of hitting that target. One down? Just Eight. a few to go. <laughs> it's really nice to see everyone working together, churning them out. And as the light fades on the second day, they've all risen to the challenge. Well done for roughing this out, Sarah. Thank you. Guys, want to bring yours over and yes. see what we've got. Sarah still needs to be cut. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And any, any others half there's produced? One on the lathe. So eight. So there's only one more to go after that's finished. That's great. Well done, considering what incredibly hard work it was and how technically difficult it is to get the, the finish on that. And I think you've done really well, but I think we should pack it in because well, everyone's knackered again. <laughs> Well done, see you See you bright and breezy. Bye. The exhausted trainees head home, whilst Guy remains behind to finish the last skittle. Mm. 
the next evening, they deliver the order to their clients. Cool. They are indeed looking very good. I see you've made quite a fair fist of cutting them off square. They're standing vertical. Yeah. They do look excellent. They do look really, really good. So far, so good. But will they perform as well as they look? Hold it together, sir. Go on. Focus. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> Our trainees have had four weeks now to learn the basic skills of green woodworking. Now they've got ten days to put all that together in a piece that they design and make themselves. The best one will have a chance to exhibit it here at Ford Abbey for a year. 50,000 people pass through here and they are all exactly the market that they're aiming at. So far, we've been in the, in the teaching workshop, but in true style of bodgers working in the woods, um, we think it's about time that we got you working in your own shelters in the woods. The point of this exercise is to build a contemporary version of a bodger shelter. We're trying to separate them so they get that feeling of being on their own in the woods, um, which will be a big change for them after this sort of group dynamic they've had. And it'll enable them to focus, hopefully, much more on their particular work. Got it. Do you like this? That's great. It's a great design and very, very simple. So it's time for your final project now. You've got to design and make your own chair. So good luck, work hard, and uh, I hope you're going to make me proud of you. Having established their own individual camps, or bodgers' hovels, the three are going to select a tree to cut down to provide the wood for their chairs. Today we're going to the woods to select a tree, or a couple of trees, and what really excites me is that we're meeting a man who's bringing a horse to pull the wood out. And that is something I want to see. We're meeting up with Mace Brightwater, who uses traditional methods to manage the woodland at Ford Abbey. See, that's yeah. a lovely... That, how about that for straight ash there? That's, that's lovely. I mean, it's, yeah, it's quite a tall tree, though, isn't it? Let me just have a look around the other side. Taking a tree is no small undertaking, yeah. so you use it efficiently and you give some yeah. respect yeah. back yeah. to the planet. I mean, that's yeah. part of something I believe in religiously. So this is quite a luxury, this process. Have you found the tree you want? Yeah, but this is lovely and straight. <laughs> this is the one for me, anyway. I think put that to Mace and see if he'll Definitely fit it. Definitely that one. I'm looking at that and thinking, is it possibly a bit big for your purpose? This is probably my first consideration, but it does seem to have quite a nice straight form, evenly balanced canopy, so nothing too unusual going on there. As good as any. Let's do it. Then the horse comes in and effortlessly draws the tree trunk away, barely leaving a hoof print in its wake. A thought that I've had today, and particularly seeing the tree come down, is that our lives are so divorced from the source of things. You know, even if we do DIY and make it, we receive it in neatly prepared boards from a store. And actually to see a tree come down, and then from that tree you make the finished object, reinforces the importance of the connection of, of a piece of furniture, or even a spoon, to a growing tree. Back at the camp, Tom has wasted no time in deciding what type of chair he wants to make and quickly knocks up a prototype. Well, it kind of rocks. Meanwhile, Sarah has decided to bypass some of the more challenging Greenwood skills to make what's known as stick furniture. Lots of people in the greenwood work, work world um, slightly look down upon stick furniture as, as a less skilled um, version of, of greenwood work. And frankly, compared with the chair that we've made as the project and the stool we made, it is less skilled. Yeah, but I don't think that 
makes it any better or worse, it's just different. Despite designing gardens for a living, Charles still hasn't settled on his design. I'm a little bit experimental. I've gone slightly off piece. I'm not starting with a basic chair as a design. I'm slightly nervous that I could look a complete twit. When I return to the camp a few days later, I learn that Sarah's ducking out of the challenge and immediately think it's a big mistake that she may come to regret later. How are you? I'm OK, thank you. I'm really well, yeah. What did you think you were going to get out of this? Why did you start this? I wanted to discover what it was like mentally and physically, you know, how challenging it was to work as, as the Bodgers did. I wanted to do all of that. It was just a lot more difficult. And with your stick furniture, I mean, obviously you're not doing the same as the guys, which changes everything, because the whole idea was that you'd all do it together and, you know, you'd share the experience. Oh, I, I don't know. Just part of me just thinks perhaps I could just not do the stick furniture, just get a piece of log and do a ladder back chair. And if mm. I haven't completed it in eight days, at least I've tried to do that. Mm. Maybe. If you gave it a go and pushed yourself a bit harder out there to do what they were doing, you might get more back out of it. I think that's unfair, because I think that I have, I have pushed myself, and I think I've pushed myself to the limits, right. if not further than that. Well, OK, that's a fair comment. But after sleeping on it, Sarah has a change of heart. What Monty kind of pointed out yesterday was that I'm here to learn traditional methods. I want to make an identical chair to this, but out of the green wood processes that you've taught us in the last four weeks. Brilliant. Yes. Brilliant. <laughs> oh, that well, no, that's fantastic. You're going to need to concentrate on that measuring thing <laughs> and the accuracy thing. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, great. Go for it. Thank you. Good luck with it. Thank you. And Sarah isn't the only one who's lost time deliberating. After two whole days, Charles has only just decided on a design. I think if time permits, I'd like to try and do a rocking chair on the basis that that kind of adds everything up. Um, it ticks all the boxes. Um, I'm not as quick and as uh, proficient as Tom is, so I'm going to find that a bit of an uphill battle. Excellent, we'll get on with it then. Yeah, I better have. <laughs> <laughs> so now they're all committed. But if they're going to meet the deadline, Charles and Sarah have got some serious catching up to do. I'll put in as much time as possible to get it done. I want to be proud of it. It's a really, really difficult challenge, this final task. To be asked to make a freestyle chair after so little experience is a massive ask. It's taking me a lot longer than I had imagined or have allowed for. At the beginning, there's no way that I would have done this. It's knowing the technique and building up your strength to be able to do it. There's a different level of consistency here compared with last week. These are the same sort of quality as the boys' ones, so you're back in the race again, which is just fantastic. <laughs> Sarah's tucked herself away, and who knows what she might put out of the bag. And I hope she does, really, to be honest. It would be brilliant if her she wins, I think. Do you know when you just give everything, but you might not get there? And the more you give, the more you've got to lose, really. I'm trying to do the best I can. Perhaps that will be my downfall. I haven't seen Charles this focused yet. Yeah, I mean, it is no racket. There's no question about it. There are three days left to go, and they're all feeling the pressure. In his rush to make up time, Charles again slips up by drilling a hole in the wrong place in one of his chair legs. Um... So that hole should be below this. It should be here. So I've got to remake that bit, which I... Probably, I will get done, but I certainly won't get the thing finished now. Oh! It's a disaster. Back in the saddle. First thing you should do after a crash. There's nothing Charles can do except make another leg, and fast. Oh, Tom and Sarah both stop work on their own chairs to help him. So you've got all your weight on that, Tom. Thank you very much, everybody. No problem. As if the looming deadline isn't pressure enough, with just two days to go, Mike Abbott, the leading Greenwood expert in the country, arrives in the camp. He is, like, the man. Um, so I'm feeling quite anxious, actually. Yeah, the pressure's on him. I suppose it's like your head teacher coming to look at your work. I'm really nervous. 
Hi, Hi, Mike. Tom. Hi, Mike. Nice to meet you. So what are you up to then, Tom? Um, I'm just trying to sort out my slats for the back of my chair. I need to make these parts, the top and bottom rail and the right. spindles. So, <laughs> so you're going to be full at it this weekend? It. Afraid so, yeah. yeah. Well, crack on with it, Tom. <laughs> I'm Mike. Hi, Mike. Hi, Charles. How you're you? Charles. Then this yeah. is part of your final, yeah, final I'm construction. Yeah, to make a rocking chair. I made a mistake the other day, so I had to start again on another leg, which is always a bit of a, a nuisance. Right. So, but you'll not do that again, will you? No, I won't do it again. <laughs> <laughs> this is I you do can read things so people can tell it. you things until you've actually done it. I yeah. mean, this, yeah, this no, is why... It's a major mistake. 24 years of experience means there's not a mistake I haven't made, I shouldn't think. Yeah. If I haven't made it, I've seen somebody else make it, and, and that's the only way it sticks. Sarah, Hi, Sarah. Right, nice, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. What are you making then? I'm making the child's chair. I've got all my components, yeah. so um, my, my sides are made. So I need to do my back, pop the sides together, and then seat it and oil. Well, I can see you've got a lot to be getting on with, so I'll leave you to it then. Thank okay. You. I'm excited by the idea that they're uh, you know pushing ideas and trying things out, but that's that's you know chances you know it's fifty fifty chance of it actually working. With just twenty four hours to go. None of them are nearly ready. I've got a long way to go before I finish. And as the evening draws into night, even Tom's chances of finishing his chair are looking slim. I really don't want to leave here without a finished chair. Six weeks ago, I first came here to meet the trainees and I'm fascinated to see what they've managed to achieve in this incredibly short time. How are things? Tense. Tense, oh, I like the sound of that. Thank you, thank you. I see. Yeah, and you. Okay. Sarah's still down there. Right. How's Fini she doing? Finishing her chair. Uh -huh. And these guys, well, Tom probably will finish in time, just. And Charles has thrown in the towel and making his last bits beautifully but not putting it together. How do you feel about that? I think he's made the right decision for him. He wants to get it right, as opposed to finished in time. Mike. This is Mike. How nice to Mike meet Campbell. you. Hello, Monty. Very nice to we meet, meet you. We meet at last. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> How are things going here? It's going great. What I love is what always happens in chairs is that the maker's characteristics, character, is coming out in each chair. And this is a beautiful example of that, actually. Really? How are you? I'm good, thank right. you. Nice How to see you. you. Nice to see you too. And Before Mike makes Things his expert really judgment, I'm keen to see the progress for myself. It's a good chair, isn't it? <laughs> thank you. Two weeks ago, when I said you made a chair, you got cross with me. I could I, see it. I got. I, I didn't get cross. I think I was so frustrated in myself that I wanted. I knew that I wasn't doing what I came here to do, mm. and I kind of just thought, I've just got to give it a go. Fantastic. But have you actively enjoyed it? Making this chair yeah. has been one of the most amazing things that I've ever done. I've enjoyed absolutely every single part of the process. I'm going to go home happy. That's what good. I came to do. Very, very and good. And thank you for your chat a few weeks ago. It's what I needed. I'm yeah. really delighted. So this is part of the chair that isn't going to be assembled. This is it, yeah. It's Would you say that, that you were a perfectionist? Um, I want to get it right, yeah, definitely. And um, I think, you know, everybody sets their own standards. So what you're saying is, is that learning the craft is much more important than any idea of a competition. Absolutely, and yeah. I think you've got to strive for perfection. I mean, if you don't, how can you have any pride in what you're doing? How's that going? Looks it's good. good, yeah. Is your fascination growing with this? I mean, it's six weeks now. Yeah, it's definitely not waning, I must say. Yeah. Right, it's time to be stand up and be counted. What are you looking for? What criteria are you using? Well, I think, firstly, what basically is a chair there for? And a chair is a thing to sit on and sit on comfortably. After that come in things like looks and quality of finish, but they're not the, the be-all and end-all. Let's start with Sarah. It's a nice-looking little chair. You have not achieved a polished finish. I can see a gap in that joint. Turn it round, that is a, a wonderful joint there. That's really good and tight. She's made these three little spindles here. And if I look at those, that is really, really rock solid. So that's, that's a really nice, nice little detail, that, in, in the chair. So what about functionality? I'm afraid I'm going to sit in it. And uh, we're on a rather soft floor, but I'm happy to rock back in that. I don't detect any creaking whatsoever. <laughs> well done, Sarah. It's a beauty. This is Tom. He has got 
a rather finer finish. This is a weak point here that is rotating there. We've got to test it. Uh, nice, yeah, good. It's nicely made. Yeah. I think it looks beautiful. To the next chair, which is Charles's. I mean, what I would really like to be able to do is, is undo all this lot now and feel the frame. Can I do that? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah by all means. Yeah. We've got two nice wooden frames. I can do that. I can feel the flex of the wood in it. That's bringing out the greenwood quality. Uh, they look to be really solid, really nicely done. But I suspect there's an awful lot of time being spent on there, which could have been spent on doing something else on the chair, which would have got you nearer to getting it complete. Mm. I'm afraid I come back again to saying what I, I say so often is that the chair reflects the person. That reflects Sarah. <laughs> it's full of character, it's warm, uh, and, and it's honest. This has been made confidently, it's big, it says, here I am, take me as I am. This says, I need to sort things out a bit. You've got to choose one of these three and decide that it is the best chair of the three. <laughs> well, I don't think it'll be any great surprise to you that Charles is not, not in, the, in the final runoff. Between these two, I just love Sarah's chair and it, it is Sarah and I know she is, I am absolutely certain she's going to go on and pursue this, but I have to say that this is the winning chair. There has to be no doubt about it. If Tom wanted to go on and become a full-time chair maker, he can make it. This, it's a beautiful oh, wow. chair. Well done, Thank Tom. Thank you. Well done, Tom. <laughs> Thank you. Very good. Well done. Thank you. Cheers, God. Thank, Thank you very much. much. I felt that I really have learned something since I've been here. I don't know where it'll take me or what I'll do with it, but I mean, there's a hundred things that I could potentially do with it. It's been so, so intense. All the things that I held so important, like the way that kind of I look and all that stuff, just goes out the window. Crafting something, it's just more important than anything else. Thank you. Tom. Thank you. It's been a, just an incredible experience, the whole thing. You know, the skills I've learned, and I suppose really the, the kind of the understanding that I could, I could carry this on, it could become like a big part of my life, and that's, that's really exciting. Well, I think everybody feels a bit drained after that. And do you know, I think Sarah nearly won that. I think she was a whisker away because although she had to overcome so much, the chair she made was both very good and also had real character. But Tom is clearly good at making chairs, and, and if he wants to, he's got a career ahead of him. He could go on to be a really good chair maker. And what's wonderful about all this, for all of us that have been involved in it, is the connection. A simple thing like a chair suddenly becomes meaningful. It's full of character. It's full of the woods and the trees and it really adds depth to an everyday object. Next time, we introduce a painter and decorator, a builder of cob houses, and a roofer to the craft of thatching. How does this compare with the sort of pace they have to go at? Remarkably slow. Right. <laughs> <laughs> While they wrestle with the intricacies and vagaries of straw... It's not coming off. It is. It just needs turning. No, it's cake. coming off. I'll be discovering what Thatch can tell us about our rural past. It's a real honour, really, to be able to lay a thatch on a, on a piece of history. <laughs> <laughs>